America loves an underdog. It's one of our cherished mythologies. The New York Jets are the world champions. They have upset the Baltimore Colts. It's one of the great enduring ideas that David can beat Goliath. No one had ever beaten two Goliaths before. When Francis we met was four years old, his family moved to 246 Clyde Street, which is right across the street from the country club's 17th hole. You go out of the club, you take a right turn, you come to the first stop sign, there's a white house with green shutters. The house still stands. I've stood up in what was his bedroom window, and there's the 17th hole right there in front of him. This place was his field of dreams. He and his brother would go over there, they'd find golf balls, they'd find golf clubs. That's the equipment they would use to go out and play. And as we met, caddied a little more and played a little bit more, he became one of the best high school golfers in Massachusetts. And the hole that was closest to his house turned out to be the most important hole he played in his life. In 1913, Harry Barton and Ted Ray were the two best players in the world. Ted's a familiar figure from the archetypes of storytelling. He's the bigger-than-life guy who ate and drank everything in his path. He said, all you need to play golf, big hands, big feet, and no damn brains. That was just his way of going about it. Harry Varden was the biggest name in golf in 1913. He was already a five-time British Open champion, had won the U.S. Open in 1900. I mean, he was so big, they actually rescheduled the U.S. Open that year around his schedule of when he was coming to America. The U.S. Open typically played in June, moved back to September, because that's when the Varden and Ray exhibition was happening that year. They toured all over the country. They played matches against local pros in every city they visited. They beat them all. They were undefeated. They came into Boston for the U.S. Open. Here are these two behemoths come striding into town, and there's this young, willowy stripling who lives across the street who's never really won much of anything. I mean, he had one good showing in the U.S. Amateur. He made it to the quarterfinals. He won the Massachusetts State Amateur once. Francis wins the Massachusetts Amateur in the summer of 1913, and he goes down to Garden City and plays in the U.S. Amateur. He loses in the second round to the defending champion, Jerry Travers. Before he leaves the championship, the head of the USGA, Robert Watson, asks him if he's planning to play in the U.S. Open. And Francis says no, he hadn't actually given it any thought, even though he's living across the street from the country club where the Open is going to be played. And Watson wants to have Francis play, and he says to him, give me $5 and you're in. Francis gave him $5, and that's how he came to play in the 1913 U.S. Open. It was so extraordinary, factored in by the fact that he has this ragtag young boy, Eddie Lowry, as his caddy, 10 years old. Francis said that he wouldn't be surprised if Eddie walked over to Varden and Ray and said, you might as well go home and pack your bags. You're not going to win this. Get ready to get on the ship. And that kind of personality was valuable for Francis to have because it's vocalizing the determination, the gumption, that the reserved Francis was not going to ever show. But he needed to have that voice in his ear, and that was Eddie Lowry. Because the story is so improbable to begin with, the course had to unfold that the pivotal hole in both the final round and the playoff would have to be the hole that he grew up looking out his window at, the 17th. It's the perfect end of the fairy tale. In regulation, we met trails both Varden and Ray by one stroke, needs to make a birdie on one of the last two holes. He birdies the 17th to force a playoff. And then the next day, he is basically down to Varden as being his challenger. We met has a one-shot lead on 17. What I was able to trace researching Francis's life is that they had manufactured a golf ball, the Spalding Company, called the Varden Flyer. 
and he had found a Varden flyer when he was caddying on the golf course at the country club, and he wanted to know who this guy was, so I think he fixated on him a little bit. You draw a line forward, and here he is facing off against him. It's like a Western. The kid growing up admiring the gunfighter, and here he is standing on the other side of the OK Corral. We met Leeds Varden by one stroke going into that 17th hole. It's a dog leg left with trees and a bunker on the left elbow protecting that side. Varden tries to cut the corner, hits it into the bunker that's now affectionately known as the Varden Bunker. He makes bogey. Francis plays safe. He hits the ball to the right half of the fairway. Hits his ball onto the green, said between 15 and 18 feet from the cup. And he was just trying to get the ball close because he knew he was going to pick up that shot from Varden. And he said that he watched it just dribble into the hole. So he birdied the same hole back to back to get into the playoff, in essence, to secure the victory. Francis, we met when he was 15 years old, was caddying here. Five years later, he wins the US Open here. To go from asking somebody what club they'd like to hit to sinking the final putt in the playoff where you've beaten the two best golfers in the world. If America is supposed to be the land of opportunity, the 1913 Open proved that again. If the 300 Spartans had actually succeeded in beating the invading Persians, that might have been an upset on this level. Maybe if Fort Sumter had stayed undefeated, you know, you have to think of absurd examples because what he did was so unthinkable. It's the most wonderful thing that's happened in the history of golf, and it probably still is.